A memory leak occurs when a program does not release memory that it was using previously. So this usually happens when the program is unable to reach the memory. Uh, it's lost its reference somewhere along the line to that memory. It can't figure out where exactly that memory is within the system. So that memory is now unreachable. So essentially the software was using that memory and then the reference was disrupted or lost and now that memory is still shown as being used by that program but the program is actually not using that memory anymore but the program is also not able to release the memory because it can't find what it was using in the first place. It's kind of a way to think about it. Memory leaks can be very difficult to find, they can be difficult to pin down and you may be wondering why your system is using excess resources and finding a memory leak really requires knowledge of your programs, knowledge of the architecture and the code. So it could be a little difficult to really pinpoint where memory leaks are occurring but they can affect your system performance. An integer, integer overflow. This is when you have uh, an integer that's stored, a good example and an easy example to understand with this is a very large integer. So say you have uh, an enormous integer, okay? Integers can only be stored usually with a fixed number of bits, 32 or 64 is the norm. So if you have a large, large number, uh, it's gonna take up most of those bits. It might even take up all of them. It could almost fill that bit size by itself. Now, if you have a large integer that exceeds 32 bits and you have, you're using a 32-bit architecture, that's fine. The, when you store that integer, it's gonna be broken out and stored properly. But when you have an integer that is almost 32 bits and then you add to it, then you can create an overflow. And when you have that overflow, it depends on what type of programming language you're using the excess number or the excess part that uh, exceeded 32 bits might do one of uh, several things depending on the programming language. A good way in some languages the integer will actually wrap around and it'll display as a small number like think of a car odometer when you hit a certain number of miles you're at a million miles all of a sudden your odometer wraps around to zero miles so it shows you have you finally have a brand new car and that's how brand new cars are made okay but when you have integer uh, overflow attackers can use this to write to these very large integers and then add a little bit of code into that integer and write integers to other locations so they're writing a number to a specific or a another location because that integer is being stored, the excess information is being stored somewhere else. It's a difficult concept to understand. Just remember that if you have a large number that almost reaches the bit size for the integer and then you add to that integer, you can create an opportunity to write that excess portion to another location. It's kind of similar to a buffer overflow. So a buffer is an area of memory that's used to temporarily store data while it's being transferred. Best example I can think of a buffer is with a video. You watch a video and the information is being streamed to you and there's a little bit if you look at your loading bar, there's a little bit that's slightly a brighter gray usually than the rest of the bar. That's your buffer. That's information that's being stored in your buffer, in the buffer, uh, while it's being transferred to you. So if there's any slight interruption in the connection, it's not gonna make your video choppy or freeze your video. If there was no buffer and there was any interruption in your video, your video would stop immediately. So say you hit a spotchy bit of uh, 
of a signal and you're transferring, you're watching something on your smartphone. You know, you're like you're on a train or something or you're, you're on the subway. If you're watching that video and there's no buffer, every time you hit a minor uh, signal disruption, the video would stop. With the buffer, you've stored a little bit of the information ahead of time. So what the video would do is tap into that buffer and show you what it's already stored until it gets another signal and then it would try and reconstruct that buffer. Okay? So when you have a buffer overflow, you have an attacker that attempts to store more information than the buffer can handle. The excess information is written then into adjacent memory sectors. And this allows attackers to try and inject code into other sectors that weren't intended to be written into just because there's too much for that buffer. Getting into the specifics is not really necessary, especially for the exam. If you wanna research this a little more, by all means, go for it. Just know that when an attacker injects memory into adjacent memory sectors, by overloading the buffer, that's buffer overflow. And C and C++ are the most acceptable programming languages for buffer overflow attacks. Pointer dereference. So this happens when a pointer is listed as null or a program. So what a pointer is, a pointer is a, uh, allows a program to access a specific memory sector. Okay. So the pointer references the program to that memory sector. When the pointer does not point to any, anything, any object or function, it's known as a null pointer. So if at any point a program has a pointer and that pointer stops pointing to something, becomes a null pointer. And this can create, usually the program will crash at this point because it's not able to access the memory it needs to run. But what an attacker can do is an attacker can force a pointer to become a null pointer and cause a program to attack so, or to crash. So by doing so, the attacker is conducting an availability attack. They're dereferencing the pointers. They're changing them to null pointers and causing different programs to crash. And if you have like improper error handling, like we talked about earlier, where that error code will show additional information or create additional security vulnerabilities, this can be very useful for the attacker. So a pointer dereference causes the pointer, which the program uses to access memory, to become null or point to nothing, basically. A dynamic link library is a set of uh, code that can be used multiple times. It can be used by more than one program and it can be updated by itself. So a good example of this, it's kind of an abstract concept, but think of like a library and think of a, a piece of tax software, okay? Tax software, what changes with tax software from year to year? Well, the tax software itself shouldn't change. You should still be able to add numbers and subtract percentages and input deductions, et cetera. But what changes is the law, the tax law itself. So in order to update that tax law, the tax software shouldn't have to go through an entire software update because that would change the user interface, it would change everything. Instead, the tax software can point to a server and download a new dynamic link library every year. So in this way, the tax software remains the same. You could be using QuickBooks 2016 in the year 2020, but the uh, you're actually just downloading another dynamic link library. Now what can happen is attackers can write their own dynamic link libraries or alter an existing dynamic link library and pass it off as something that's legitimate. And if they do so, they're able to create whatever vulnerabilities they want in the software because the software has accepted the attacker's dynamic link library as a legitimate one. So the software, the attacker can create security backdoors or put uh, malicious code in that dynamic link library. Now, in order to inject 
an attacker's dynamic link library, the attacker needs to dereference the first dynamic link library and then accept the new dynamic link library as legitimate. This is usually going to require uh, some sort of some other type of attack or some sort of network exploitation ahead of time. But by doing this type of attack, an attacker can perhaps hijack in another account using that software, using uh, that new DLL, they can might assume the identity of an, a, different a different account or an administrator account that uses that software just with this DLL attack. So it could be used for a method of escalation of privilege.